Stories of Futures Past presents Five Stories Featuring The Moon Task to Luna by Alfred Koppel Moon Glow by G. L. Vandenberg Reaching for the Moon by S. A. Lombino Project Hush by William Ten Moon Dust by Oliver Sari Task to Luna by Alfred Koppel Originally published in Planet Stories, January 1951 Narrated by Tom Tresel The rockets started almost simultaneously from two widely separated points on the great curving surface of Earth they reached upward and outward toward the Moon. It wasn't really so strange a coincidence. Space navigation is governed by mathematics and logic, not politics. The fact that man-carrying spaceships happened to be developed concurrently on two sides of an iron curtain meant little to the universe. It happened, that's all. And there is a proper time to launch such missiles. When that time came, they were launched. In a manner of speaking, it was a race, a race wherein the prizes were such things as gravity gauge and surveillance point and impregnable launching sites. The contestants were earnest, capable men, each certain that the moon must not fall into the hands of the opponent. It made a stirring and patriotic picture, vivid with nationalistic fervour. It was thrilling with its taste of high adventure and self-sacrifice. For each rocket pilot it was a personal crusade against the thing he had been raised to regard as the enemy. But somehow, under the steady, cold scrutiny of the eternal stars, they must have looked a little ridiculous, perhaps just a tiny bit tragic too. Harsh was the moon. There was black and there was white. Great jagged cliffs and razor-backed mountains slashed the pocket surface of the crater floor, humping themselves at the huge unwinking stars. The sun was a stark disk of fire, incredibly white, hung in the black sky. The shadows were bottomless pools. Within them there was nothing. In the sunlight the pumice soil glared white. The Russian rocket had crashed on landing. Randick could see the tiny buckled shape of it high on the mountain. No doubt the pilot was dead, but he had to be sure. The risks were too great for any unsupported assumptions. He had to go up there and see for himself. Ponderous in his pressure suit, Randick emerged from the open lock of the Anglo-American rocket. He slogged across the pumice of the crater floor toward the spot where the mountain's sheer talus erupted skyward. If there were no trouble from the Rusky, he would return to his own ship and begin setting up the first cell of what would soon be the Anglo-American moon base. As soon as he signalled a safe landing and no opposition from the Russian, other rockets would come to add their cells, and presently there would be an atomic rocket pointed dead at the heart of every Russian population centre. A rocket each for Moscow, Leningrad, Kiev, Vladivostok, Randick frowned. It would be a lot simpler if the crash had finished the Russian pilot. He knew the Russians had exactly the same plan for the moon. Only the rockets would be aimed at Washington, London, Paris, San Francisco. The slight weight of the one-man bazooka on Randick's back seemed suddenly very comforting. Randick knew himself to be on the very edge of known territory, his map showed him that he was in the highest part of the Durfel Mountains. Behind him lay the two great bowls of Bailey and Shickard, and far to the north he could see, as he climbed higher, the smooth surface of the Mare Humorum. He looked up to the spine-like ridge beyond, and slightly above the wreck of the Russian ship. There was a deep pass that slashed like a wound into the backbone of the range. He felt a slight thrill. Beyond that cleft lay, mystery, the other side of the moon. 
the sun's rays beat down brutally. Even through the heavily insulated suit, Randick could feel their searing touch. All around him stretched a jumbled nightmare of black and white. He was suddenly very glad that he could not see the earth in the sky. The homesickness would be unbearable. Randick found himself frowning. He had no time for such thoughts. He was a soldier. He reminded himself that up there, in the tangled wreckage of the Russian spaceship, there might be another soldier ready to kill him. Two human beings on the moon, each eager to kill. Randick shook his head angrily. He had no right to let his mind dwell on such things. He was within a hundred yards of the wreck when a streak of fire and a soundless blast drove him into the shadows. Pumice showered him from the star-shaped depression where the explosive missile had struck. Randick cursed heartily. The Rusky was very much alive, and there wasn't a thing wrong with his eyesight. The shot had been uncomfortably close. Unslinging his bazooka, Randick began to work his way around behind the Russian rocket. A slight movement among the wreckage caught his trained eye, and he launched a projectile at it. It flared wickedly, tearing fragments of metal loose and flinging them fantastic distances down the sheer slope of the ridge. There was no return fire. Randick broke out of the shadow and ran for the cover of a large pumice-stone boulder farther up the draw. A sun-bright flash of fire splattered the loose soil a dozen feet from him. He slid for the darkness on his belly. That one had been a near thing. Behind the boulder lay a trench-like depression that sloped away up the draw toward the pass. Randick dropped it and began to crawl laboriously upward. If he could flank the Rusky, he could finish this with one good shot. Another explosion rocked the boulder he had just left. Randick didn't even look back. He felt his breath rasping in his throat, and his body felt hot and sticky inside the bulky pressure suit. Glancing down and to his right, he could see the proudly erect shape of his own rocket far below on the floor of the crater. It took him almost thirty minutes to reach the edge of the shadow that spilled from the side of the mountain pass. To his left, not ten feet away, was the sudden white glare of the pumice floor. He was well above and almost behind the wreck of the Russian ship. His flanks were heaving with the exertion of the climb as he searched the buckled mass of the crash for his opponent. There seemed to be a dark shape wedged in between two twisted bulkheads. It looked like a man. With pounding heart, Randick murmured a prayer and lifted his bazooka, aimed and pressed the firing stud. The shadow vanished in silent white fire. The return blast almost knocked him down. For a moment Randick was stunned, wondering foggily where the shot had come from. Then his brain cleared and he realised that the Rusky too had climbed to the pass, leaving Randick to fire at shadows. Randick cursed himself for his dangerous stupidity. The other must be among those shadowy rocks directly across the bright floor of the pass. He raised his bazooka carefully, searching the Stygian blackness for some sign of movement. His finger curled around the firing stud. Out of the corner of his eye he saw the flare. The Russian rocket erupted in a gout of bluish flame and the whole mountain seemed to rock. Randick stared stupidly at the glowing crater where the ship had been. For just an instant he thought that perhaps a meteorite had struck it, but the explosion had been unquestionably atomic. The Russian must have been stunned too, for he moved out into the light, empty-handed, his helmet turned woodenly toward the rapidly cooling lake of magma where his spaceship had been. They both saw the bright arc of fire that raced up from beyond the ridge and curved down gracefully toward the floor of the crater far below. Open-mouthed, Randick watched his ship vanish into flame, and he felt the vague tremor of the ground under him as the shock rumbled across the face of the moon. The Russian rocket was gone. The Anglo-American rocket was gone. Moon base was gone before it had ever been. The weapon fell from Randick's hand, and he stepped unsteadily into the light toward the Russian. 
suddenly human companionship was very, very important. Panicky terror was plucking at his throat. The two men stumbled toward each other across the pass cut deep into the jagged back of the Durfal Mountains. As one, they turned and looked out across the vast expanse of the moon's hidden face. They were soldiers. They knew an invasion base when they saw one. As far as the eye could see, lines of sleek mammoth spaceships of unknown design stretched away into the distance. The face of the vast unnamed mare was covered with them. Suddenly Randick felt himself beginning to giggle. He tried to stop, but the laughter welled up inside of him, echoing wildly within his confining helmet. He could see that the Russian was laughing too, white teeth gleaming behind the plexiglass faceplate. They laughed until they gasped. Their sides hurt with laughter. Tears rolled down their faces. They were arm in arm and still laughing when the third rocket arced down on them from out of the blackened star-flecked sky. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now for the next story. Moon Glow by G. L. Vandenberg Originally published in Amazing Stories, November 1958 Narrated by Tom Tresel The Ajax-20 was the first American spacecraft to make a successful landing on the moon. She had orbited the Earth's natural satellite for a day and a half before making history. The reason for orbiting was important. The Russians had been boasting for a number of years that they would be first. Captain Junius Robb, USAF, had orders to investigate before and after landing. The moon's dark side was explored due to the unknown hazards involved during the orbiting process. More thorough investigation was possible on the moon's familiar side. The results seemed to be incontrovertible. Captain Junius Robb and his crew of four were the first humans to tread the ashes of the long-dead heavenly body. The Russians, for all their boasts, had never come near the place. The Ajax-20 stood tall and gaunt and mighty, framed against the forbidding blackness of space. Captain Robb had manoeuvred her down to the middle of an immense crater, which the crew came to nickname the Colosseum Without Seats. Rob had orders not to leave the ship. Consequently, the crew of four scrupulously chosen, well-integrated men split into two groups of two. For three days they laboured at gathering specimens, conducting countless tests and piling up as much data as time and weight would allow. Captain Rob kept them well reminded of the weight problem attached to the return trip. Near the end of the third day, Captain Rob contacted his far-flung crew members of a helmet intercom. He ordered them back to the Ajax-20 for a briefing session. Soon the men entered the ship. They were hot, uncomfortable and exhausted. Once back on Earth, they could testify that there was nothing romantic about a 35-pound pressure suit. Hamston, the rocket expert, summed it up. With that damn bulb over his skull, a man is helpless to remove a single bead of perspiration. He could easily develop into a raving maniac. Rob held his meeting in the control room. You have eight hours to finish your work, gentlemen. We're blasting off at 0900. I beg your pardon, Captain, said Kingsley, the young man in charge of radio operation. But what about Washington? They haven't made contact yet, and I thought... I talked with Washington an hour ago. The modest cheer of approval went up for other crew members. "'Well, why didn't you say so before?' said Anderson, the first officer. Rob explained, "'It seems their equipment has been haywire for two days. They haven't been able to get through.' "'How do you like that?' cracked Farnsworth, the astrogator. "'We're 240,000 miles off the Earth, and our equipment works fine. They have all the comforts of Earth down at headquarters, and they can't repair radio transmission for two days.' The men laughed. Gentlemen, Rob continued, every radio and TV network in the country was hooked up to the chief's office in Washington. I not only talked to General Lovett, I spoke to the whole damn country. 
the men could not contain their excitement. The captain received a verbal pelting of stored-up questions. "'Did you get word to my family, Captain?' asked Kingsley. "'I hope you told them we're physically sound, Captain,' said Farnsworth. "'I have a fiancé that will never forgive me if anything happens to me. "'What's the reaction like around the country? "'Have the Russians had anything to say yet? "'Ha! I'll bet they're sore as hell. "'Do you think the army would mind if I handed my resignation?' Kingsley's remark brought vigorous applause from the others. Captain Robb held up his hand for silence. "'Hold on, hold on. First of all, General Lovett has personally contacted relatives and told them we're all physically and mentally sound. Secondly, you'd better get set to receive the biggest damn welcome in history. The General says half the nation has invaded Florida for the occasion.' "'Tell them we're not coming back,' snapped Kingsley, "'until the Florida Tourist Bureau gives us a cut.' Kingsley, the President has declared a national holiday. We'll all be able to write our own ticket. Yes, Anderson put in, to hell with the Florida Tourist Bureau. Captain Robb said, We'll be so sick of parades, we'll wish we'd stayed in this godforsaken place. Not me, boasted Farnsworth. I'm ready for a parade in my honour any old time. The sooner the better. Oh, and about the Russians, said Captain Robb, smiling. There's been nothing but a steady stream of no comment out of the Kremlin since we landed here. Right now, said Hampstead, it's probably high noon for every scientist behind the Iron Curtain. I wonder how they plan to talk their way out of this one, asked Farnsworth. Gentlemen, I'd like to go on talking about the welcome we're going to receive, but I think we'd better take first things first. Before there can be a welcome, we have to get back— and we still have to work to do before we start. "'What about souvenirs, Captain?' asked Farnsworth. Rob pursed his lips thoughtfully. "'Yes, I guess there is a matter of souvenirs, isn't there?' The others detected a note of disturbance in the way the captain spoke. Kingsley asked, "'Is anything wrong, Captain?' Rob laughed with a noticeable lack of enthusiasm. "'Nothing is wrong, Kingsley.' The fact is, we've taken on enough additional weight here to give us some concern on the return trip. He paused to study the faces of his men. They were disappointed. But, he added emphatically, I seem to remember promising something about souvenirs, and I guess a man can't travel five hundred thousand miles without something to show for it. I'll get together with Hampstead and work out something. But remember the weight problem. First trouble we encounter on the return trip, and a souvenir will be our number one expendable. The crew was more than happy with Rob's compromise. Rob went into a huddle with Hamston, the rocket expert. When he emerged, he informed the crew that each man would be permitted one souvenir which must not exceed two pounds. He allowed them four hours to find whatever they wanted. The men got back into their pressure suits and left the ship. Captain Junius Robb stood outside the Ajax-20. His eyes scanned the great circular plain that stretched for fifty miles in all directions. The distant jagged rises of the crater's rim resembled the lower half of a gigantic bear trap. The moon in all its splendour. Wasn't there a song that went something like that? The moon in all its splendour? Or lack of it, was Robb's mute opinion. The scientists, as usual were right about the place. To all intents and purposes, the moon was as dead as the Roman Empire. True, they had found scattered vegetation. There were even two or three volcanoes spewing carbonic acid, but they spewed it as though it was life's last breath. Nothing more. The fires of the moon had given way to soft, lifeless ashes. Rob was glad he had allowed the men to look for souvenirs. After all, it wasn't a hell of a lot to ask for. A man could cut press clippings and collect medals and frame citations, and probably these things would impress grandchildren some day. But it seemed that nothing would be quite as effective as for a man to be able to produce something tangible, an authentic piece of the moon itself. Captain Robb had always tried to be a humble man. He recalled an interview held by the three wire services a week before take-off, one of the reporters had asked the obvious question. Why do you want to go to the moon? He could have given all of the high-sounding, aesthetic reasons, but instead his answers was indirect. 
given with a modest smile. To get to the other side, I guess, he had told them. Like the chicken crossing the road, that was how simple and uncomplicated Rob's life had been. But now he stood, his feet spread apart, beside his mighty ship, a quarter of a million miles away from home. He was the first, and he could not fight back the feeling of pride and accomplishment that welled in him. The word first in this instant conjured up names like Balboa, Columbus, Perry, Magellan, and Junius Rob. The crew members deserved the hero's welcome they would receive. They could have the banquets, parades, and honorary degrees, but it was Junius Rob who had commanded the flight. It would be Junius Rob's name for the history books. He wouldn't be needing any souvenirs. Kingsley and Anderson were the first to return. They both carried small leather bags. Inside the ship they revealed the contents to Rob. He examined them carefully. Kingsley had found an uncommonly large patch of brownish vegetation. He had torn away a sizable chunk and placed it in the bag. Who knows, he shrugged. I might be able to cultivate it. Or let it play the lead in a science fiction movie, snapped Anderson. The first officer's bag contained a piece of one of the smaller craters. It had no immediately discernible value. It was Anderson's intention to polish it up and put some kind of a metal plaque on it. Four more hours went by, and there was no sign of Farnsworth or Hamston. Rob began to worry. He'd never forgive himself if anything happened to either of the two men. He waited another half hour, then ordered Kinsley and Anderson to put on the pressure suit and go look for the two missing crew members. The search was avoided as Farnsworth entered the ship, dragging Hamston behind him. "'What happened?' yelled Rob. Farnsworth began the job of getting out of his pressure suit. "'I don't know. Hamston's sick as a dog. I checked every inch of his suit and couldn't find anything out of order.' Rob bent over the prone rocket expert. Hamston looked up at him with half-opened eyes and an insipid grin on his face. He mumbled something about a fine state of affairs. They removed Hamston's suit and placed his limp frame on a bunk. Rob examined him for forty minutes. He reached the curious conclusion that Hamston was fit as a fiddle. The rocket expert fell asleep. Rob and the rest of the crew prepared to blast off. The Ajax-20 thrust itself through space halfway back to its home planet. The excitement of her crew members grew with every passing second. In his concern over Hampston, Farnsworth had forgotten about his souvenir. He now opened his bag and displayed it before the others. "'What is it?' asked Kingsley. "'Dust!' was Farnsworth's proud reply. "'What the hell are you going to do with dust?' Maybe you don't know it, but this is going to be the most valuable dust on the face of the earth. Do you realise what I can get for an ounce of this stuff? What's anybody want to buy dust for? Souvenirs, man, souvenirs! Farnsworth asked to see what Kingsley and Anderson had picked up. The two men obliged. For the next hour, the three men and Rob discussed the mementos and their possible uses on earth. Then Anderson said, I sure wouldn't turn down about a gallon of good Kentucky whiskey right now. Rob laughed. We did enough sweating on the way. You wouldn't want to sweat out the trip back on the belly full of booze. That may be a better idea than you think it is, Captain. The four men turned to find Hampston sitting up on his bunk. Hampston, Rob exclaimed, how do you feel? Terrible. What happened to you? asked Kingsley. Hamston stared at each man individually. He took a deep breath and his cheeks puffed up as he let it out slowly. Well, I guess you'd better know now. Rob frowned. What do you mean? Farnsworth and I separated after we got about four miles from the ship. I thought I saw something that looked like a cave. I figured I might find something interesting there to take back with me so I told Farnsworth I'd keep radio contact with him, and off I went. 
Did you find a cave? Rob wanted to know. No, it was just a big indentation in the wall of the crater. I threw some light on it and found it to be ten or fifteen feet deep. He paused, as though not sure of what to say next. So? So that's where I found my souvenir. Well, let's see it, said Anderson. Hampson opened his leather bag. The object he removed rendered the crew weak in the knees. He said, We can have that drink, Anderson, but I don't think we'll enjoy it. He poured them each a shot from a half-filled bottle of vodka. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. Reaching for the Moon by S. A. Lombino Originally published in Science Fiction Quarterly, November 1951 Narrated by Tom Trusser It was no longer a question of theory, but of money. Man could reach the moon, if Saunders could persuade someone to finance him. The laboratory was brightly lit, and four men in business suits surrounded the large table. They stared down at the blueprints on the table, some scratching their heads, others rubbing their chins in speculation. The thin man, in grey tweeds, eyed them cautiously, his breath coming in short, anxious rushes. The big man at the head of the table adjusted his eyeglasses, his hand lingering on the rim for a second. Then he cleared his throat and said, "'It won't work, Dr. Saunders.' The little man in grey tweeds darted impatient eyes at the man who had just spoken. "'Why won't it work? Why not?' "'It can't be done,' the big man stated simply. "'Maybe sometime in the future, but certainly not now.' Saunders stretched a bony hand out from the cuff of his tweeds. "'It can be done,' he said, slapping that hand on the table. "'It's all here. You've just seen it. You've studied it. Damn it, this isn't a fly-by-night affair. I worked on these plans for more than eight years. I know it will work.' A man in blue surge shrugged and said, "'I'm afraid Bragg is right, Dr. Saunders.' He tugged at his collar, the fat hanging in loose folds around his neck. Saunders turned to eye the newcomer. "'You agree?' he asked defiantly. Even after studying my work, you agree that my proposed rocket couldn't possibly reach the moon? It might, the man in blue surge admitted, but we can't speculate on a thing of this nature. After all, Dr. Saunders, there'll be money involved, and— Money, Saunders snorted in disgust. Is that all you're worried about? You're one of the richest men of earth, Mr. Peterson. How can you let money stand in the way of what may well be man's greatest achievement? Bragg spoke again, peering from behind the thick lenses of his eyeglasses. Peterson is right. This thing would cost millions, more than any of us would be willing to risk. We appreciate your considering us, but— Saunders cut in sharply. Did that go for all of you? Is Mr. Bragg speaking for all of you? A heavy silence crowded into the room. Saunders confronted Peterson again. "'He speaks for me,' Peterson said. "'And you, Mr. Thorpe?' Saunders asked. "'Yes, yes, I'm inclined to agree,' a balding man in Glen Plaid announced. "'Mr. Slade!' Saunders turned to a weasel-like man dressed in solemn black. Slade nodded, his face chalky white against the black of his garb. "'I've asked you four men because you were probably the richest men on earth. I've asked you because I thought perhaps you would see the significance of such a project.' "'To reach the moon!' Saunders' eyes gleamed with intense light. "'To reach the moon!' "'And when we reach it?' Peterson asked. "'Then what?' "'Unlimited space!' Saunders answered with feeling. "'New worlds! Worlds beyond the imagination of man! "'The moon is only the first step, the experimental step. "'From there, Mars, or Venus, or a new solar system!' Bragg said, "'Rubbish. Even if this should work, I'm not at all convinced it will, but even if it should, what's on the moon for us? Bare crags and lonely craters, cold, bleak atmosphere, nothing.' "'Nothing that would bring in money, true,' Saunders said. 
But look at Copernicus and Galileo. Look at Pasteur and Edison and Curie. Look at... Oh, I could get on all night. What these men contributed to mankind can never be measured in terms of gold or silver. Can't you see that? Who wants to go to the moon anyway? Thorpe asked, passing a hand over his bald head. We've got troubles of our own right here on earth. Plenty to settle right here, man. Plenty. In a little while, perhaps. Sometime in the future. Twenty, twenty-five years. But now, unthinkable. We've been saying that too long, Saunders snapped. Now is the time. Not twenty or twenty-five years from now, but right now. Science has given us the means. It's up to us to take the opportunity and use it. It couldn't be done profitably, Peterson said dryly. Profitably? Saunders said bitterly. Are your wars profitable? He suddenly shouted, bringing his bony fist crashing to the tabletop. Let's not get violent, Slade said. It was the first thing he'd said all night. Saunders somehow had the feeling that a corpse had spoken. Exactly, he said. Let's not get violent. Let's spend some of the money that's been buying munitions and lives instead of raising cities to the ground. Let's go up into the skies. Let's spend that money for a project that's worth while. For once, forget the profit and think of the meaning to mankind. He paused and his voice grew lower. We've been ravaged by too many wars, gentlemen. Can't we stop this useless butchery and devote our time and energy to something constructive? Can't we? I know my rocket will work. It's scientifically sound. I know, too, that I can get a crew of scientists and technicians to take it to the moon and back. All I need is the money and a little time. Just a little time. There's a war going on, Saunders, Bragg reminded him. He had lit a cigar with a gold lighter and was sitting now, puffing leisurely, blowing smoke at the ceiling. I know, Saunders said, two wars in the past thirty years, and now another one. But consider this a moment. A trip to the moon would probably end all hostilities on Earth. It would probably unify this planet as no other force has ever done. It will galvanize humanity into constructive action. It will open new vistas that cannot possibly admit plans for war. Peterson yawned openly. Hmm, I must say you're an idealist, Saunders. I doubt very much if anything short of a trip to the sun would unify the people of Earth. He chuckled a little at this, and looked to the others for approval. That's right, Bragg agreed. There'll always be wars, Saunders. The Earth is overpopulated. Always will be. More reason to find new worlds, Saunders said tiredly. The only solution is war, Bragg insisted. Survival of the fittest. Forget your crazy ideas about new worlds. There's plenty of room right here for the people who win. And suppose we lose this time? Saunders asked. We'll never lose, Bragg said with certainty. Slade smiled a thin, wry smile. Exactly, Bragg, he said. As for me, whenever people are ready to fight, I'll be ready to supply them with the goods they'll need. In the meantime... The moon can wait. A year, maybe two, Saunders pleaded, and the universe will be open to us. Think of it, think of it. Again his eyes lit with intense ardour. You think of it, Bragg said. I'm going home. The other men nodded and began bustling into their overcoats. Saunders stood by helplessly, feeling his last ounce of strength seep from his body. Nice of you to think of us, Thorpe said cheerily. Business is business, though. Yes, Saunders said quietly. If you can figure a way to put a warhead on that rocket of yours, Slade suggested. Not a bad idea, Bragg admitted. Well, Saunders, Peterson said, we've got to be running. No hard feelings, of course. In fact, I wish you lots of luck. He chuckled again and opened the door. Good night. The rest of the men filed out after him, nodding their farewells. Saunders watched them through the window of his laboratory, watched chauffeurs open the doors of long limousines, watched tail lights disappear into the blackness of the night, little red pinpoints emphasising his failure. He walked back to the table and sat, cradling his head in his arms, leaning on the blueprints of his ship. All I needed was money, 
he thought, money and a little time. A year or two at the most. A year or two. Slowly he rose and brushed a thin hand over his wet eyes. There was work to be done, and tomorrow was another day. He walked to the door leading to his inner laboratory and paused. It was past midnight, and being a punctilious person, Saunders ripped the day's page from the calendar, exposing the new day to view. The new day was September 21st, the year 3951. He snapped off the lights and stepped quickly into the other room. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. Project Hush by William Ten Originally published in Galaxy Science Fiction, February 1954 Narrated by Tom Trussell I guess I'm just a stickler, a perfectionist, but if you do a thing, I always say you might as well do it right. Everything satisfied me about the security measures on our assignment except one, the official army designation. Project Hush. I don't know who thought it up, and I certainly would never ask, but whoever it was, he should have known better. Damn it, when you want a project kept secret, you don't give it a designation like that. You give it something neutral, some name like the Manhattan and Overlord they used in World War II, which won't excite anybody's curiosity. But we were stuck with Project Hush, and we had to take extra measures to ensure secrecy. A couple of times a week, everyone on the project had to report to Psycho for DD and HA, dream detailing and hypnoanalysis, instead of the usual monthly visit. Naturally, the commanding general of the heavily fortified research post to which we were attached could not ask what we were doing, under penalty of court-martial, but he had to be given further instructions to shut off his imagination like a faucet every time he heard an explosion. Some idiot in Washington was actually going to list Project Hush in the military budget by name. It took fast action, I can tell you, to have it entered under miscellaneous X research. Well, we'd covered the unforgivable blunder, though not easily, and now we could get down to the real business of the project. You know, of course, about the A-bomb, H-bomb and C-bomb, because information that they existed had been declassified. You don't know about the other weapons being devised. And neither did we, reasonably enough, since they weren't our business. But we had been given properly guarded notification that they were in the works. Project Hush was set up to counter the new weapons. Our goal was not just to reach the moon. We had done that on 24th of June 1967 with an unmanned ship that carried instruments to report back data on soil, temperature, cosmic rays and so on. Unfortunately, it was put out of commission by a rock slide. An unmanned rocket would be useless against the new weapons. We had to get to the moon before any other country did and set up a permanent station, an armed one and do it without anybody else knowing about it. I guess you see now why we on Damn the Name Project Hush were so concerned about security, but we felt pretty sure before we took off that we had plugged every possible leak. We had all right. Nobody even knew we had raised ship. We landed at the northern tip of Mare Nubium, just of Regio Montanus, and after planting a flag with appropriate throat-catching ceremony, had swung into the realities of the tasks we had practised on so many dry runs back on Earth. Major Monroe Gridley prepared the big rocket, with its tiny cubicle of living space, for the return journey to Earth which he alone would make. 
Lieutenant Colonel Thomas Hawthorne painstakingly examined our provisions and portable quarters for any damage that might have been incurred in landing. And I, Colonel Benjamin Rice, first commanding officer of Army Base No. 1 on the moon, dragged crate after enormous crate out of the ship on my aching academic back and piled them in the spot two hundred feet away where the plastic dome would be built. We all finished at just about the same time, as per schedule, and went into phase two. Monroe and I started work on building the dome. It was a simple prefab affair, but big enough to require an awful lot of assembling. Then, after it was built, we faced the real problem, getting all the complex internal machinery in place and in operating order. Meanwhile, Tom Hawthorne took his plump self off in the single-seater rocket which, up to then, had doubled as a lifeboat. The schedule called for him to make a rough three-hour scouting survey in an ever-widening spiral from our dome. This had been regarded as a probable waste of time, rocket fuel and manpower, but a necessary precaution. He was supposed to watch for such things as bug-eyed monsters out for a stroll on the lunar landscape. Basically, however, Tom's survey was intended to supply extra geological and astronomical meat for the report which Monroe was to carry back to Army HQ on Earth. Tom was back in forty minutes. His round face, inside its transparent bubble helmet, was fish belly white. And so were ours, once he told us what he'd seen. He had seen another dome. The other side of Maranubium, in the Rifain Mountains, he babbled excitedly. It's a little bigger than ours, and is a little flatter on top. And it's not translucent either, with splotches of different colours here and there. It's a dull, dark, heavy grey. But that's all there is to see. No markings on the dome? I asked worriedly. No signs of anyone or anything around it? Neither, Colonel. I noticed he was calling me by my rank for the first time since the trip started, which meant he was saying in effect, Man, have you got a decision to make? Hey, Tom, Monroe put in. Couldn't be just a regularly shaped bump in the ground, could it? I'm a geologist, Monroe. I can distinguish artificial from natural topography. Besides... He looked up. I just remembered something I left out. There's a brand new tiny crater near the dome, the kind usually left by a rocket exhaust. Rocket exhaust? I seized on that. Rockets, eh? Tom grinned a little sympathetically. Spaceship exhaust, I should have said. You can, can't tell from the crater what kind of repulsive device these characters are using. It's not the same kind of crater our rear jets leave, if that helps any. Of course it didn't. So we went into our ship and had a council of war. And I do mean war. Both Tom and Monroe were calling me Colonel in every other sentence. I used their first names every chance I got. Still, no one but me could reach a decision. About what to do, I mean. Look, I said at last, here are the possibilities. They know we are here either from watching us land a couple of hours ago, or from observing Tom's scout ship. Or they do not know we are here. They are either humans from Earth, in which case they are in all probability enemy nationals, or they are alien creatures from another planet, in which case they may be friends, enemies, or what have you. I think common sense and standard military procedure demand that we consider them hostile until we have evidence to the contrary. Meanwhile, we proceed with extreme caution so as not to precipitate an interplanetary war with potentially friendly Martians, or whatever they are. All right. It's vitally important that Army Headquarters be informed of this immediately. But since Moon to Earth radio is still on the drawing boards, the only way we can get through is to send Monroe back with a ship. If we do, we run the risk of having a garrison force, Tom and me, captured while he's making the return trip. In that case, their side winds up in possession of important information concerning our personnel and equipment, while our side has only the bare knowledge that somebody, or something, else has a base on the moon. 
So our primary need is more information. Therefore, I suggest that I sit in the dome on one end of a telephone hookup with Tom, who will sit in the ship, his hand over the firing button, ready to blast off for Earth the moment he gets the order from me. Monroe will take the single-seater down to the Rifian Mountains, landing as close to the other dome as you think safe. He will then proceed the rest of the way on foot, doing the best scouting job he can in a spacesuit. He will not use his radio, except for agreed-upon nonsense syllables to designate landing the single-seater, coming upon the dome by foot, and warning me to tell Tom to take off. If he's captured, remembering that the first purpose of a scout is acquiring and transmitting knowledge of the enemy, he will snap his suit radio on full volume and pass on as much data as time and the enemy's reflexes permit. How does that sound to you? They both nodded. As far as they were concerned, the command decision had been made, but I was sitting under two inches of sweat. One question, Tom said. Why did you pick Monroe for the scout? I was afraid you'd ask that, I told him. We are three extremely unathletic PhDs who have been in the army since we finished our schooling. There isn't too much choice, but I remembered that Monroe is half Indian. Arapaho, isn't it, Monroe? and I'm hoping blood will tell. Only trouble, Colonel, Monroe said slowly as he rose, is that I'm one-fourth Indian, and even that. Didn't ever tell you that my great-grandfather was the only Arapaho scout who was with Custer at the Little Big Horn. He'd been positive Sitting Bull was miles away. However, I'll do my best. And if I heroically don't come back... Will you please persuade the security officer of our section to clear my name for use in the history books? Under the circumstances, I think it's the least he could do. I promised to do my best, of course. After he took off, I sat in the dome over the telephone connection to Tom and hated myself for picking Monroe to do the job. But I've hated myself just as much for picking Tom, and if anything happened and I had to tell Tom to blast off, I'd probably be sitting here in the dome all by myself after that, waiting. Bros Negel came over the radio in Monroe's resonant voice. He had landed the single-seater. I didn't dare use the telephone to chat with Tom and the ship, for fear I might miss an important word or phrase from our scout. So I sat and sat and strained my ears. After a while... I heard Mishkashu, which told me that Monroe was in the neighbourhood of the other dome and was creeping towards it under cover of whatever boulders were around. And then, abruptly, I heard Monroe yell my name and there was a terrific clattering in my headphones. Radio interference. He'd been caught and whoever had caught him had simultaneously jammed his suit transmitter with a larger transmitter from the alien dome. Then... There was silence. After a while, I told Tom what had happened. He just said, Poor Monroe. I had a good idea of what his expression was like. Look, Tom, I said, if you take off now, you still won't have anything important to tell. After capturing Monroe, whatever's in that other dome will come looking for us, I think. I'll let them get close enough for us to learn something of their appearance, at least if they're human or non-human. Any bit of information about them is important. I'll shout it up to you, and you'll still be able to take off in plenty of time. All right? You're the boss, Colonel, he said in a mournful voice. Lots of luck. And then there was nothing to do but wait. There was no oxygen system in the dome yet so I had to squeeze up a sandwich from the food compartment in my suit. I sat there, thinking about the expedition. Nine years, and all that careful secrecy, all that expenditure of money and mind-cracking research, and it had come to this, waiting to be wiped out in a blast from some unimaginable weapon. I understood Monroe's last request. We often felt we were so secret that our immediate superiors didn't even want us to know what we were working on. Scientists are people. They wish for recognition too. 
and was hoping the whole expedition would be written up in the history books, but it looked unpromising. Two hours later, the scout ship landed near the dome. The lock opened and, from where I stood in the open door of our dome, I saw Monroe come out and walk toward me. I alerted Tom and told him to listen carefully. It may be a trick. He might be drugged. He didn't act drugged, though. Not exactly. He pushed his way past me and sat down on a box to one side of the dome. He put his booted feet up on another, smaller box. "'How are you, Ben?' he asked. "'How's every little thing?' I grunted. "'Well?' I know my voice skittered a bit. He pretended puzzlement. "'Well, what? Oh, I see what you mean. The other dome. You want to know who's in it. You have a right to be curious, Ben, certainly. The leader of a top-secret expedition like this, Project Hush, they call us, huh, Ben, finds another dome on the moon. He thinks he's been the first to land on it, so naturally he wants to. Major Monroe Gridley, I rapped out, you will come to attention and deliver your report, now. Honestly, I felt my neck swelling up inside my helmet. Monroe just leaned back against the side of the dome. That's the army way of doing things, he commented admiringly. Like the recruits say, there's a right way, a wrong way, and an army way. Only there are other ways too, he chuckled, lots of other ways. He's off, I heard Tom whisper over the telephone. Ben, Monroe has gone and blown his stack. They aren't extraterrestrials in the other dome, Ben, Monroe volunteered in a sudden burst of sanity. No, they're human, all right, and from Earth. Guess where? I'll kill you, I warned him. I swear I'll kill you, Monroe. Where are they from? Russia? China? Argentina? He grimaced. What's so secret about those places? Go on, guess again. I stared at him long and hard. The only place else? Sure, he said. You got it, Colonel. The other dome is owned and operated by the Navy. The goddamn United States Navy. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now for the next story. Moon Dust by Oliver Sari Originally published in Thrilling Wonder Stories, Winter 1954 Narrated by Tom Thrissel Come in, Jessop! Come in, Jessop! The voice said over and over. He reached out blindly to push it away until the tearing pain in his side cleared his mind of smothering fog. I, I, he croaked. The voice droned on, unheeding for an interminable time. Then, Jess, it deafened him. Hey, Colonel, I got him. He's alive. Jess. The voice of Colonel Markley broke in. What happened, Jessop? Then there was a deathly silence. A waiting I, I don't know, said Jessop. It's dark out there. The bullseye's dark. Or maybe I can't see. He checked his voice as he sensed its rising pitch. His groping hand found the emergency switch, and the panel lights came on before him like round eyes in the dark. Jessop, what's wrong? roared the colonel's voice. You've been silent for an hour. We watched you land, but lost you. And now we can't see you. Where are you? He asked himself the question, and the answer trickled slowly into his mind. I'm in a very small, padded place. My head and side hurt like fire. All I can see are those owl-eyed dials. There should be more to see than that. His hand next felt what his eyes now saw. The plastic glass gleam of the bullseye only a few inches from his face. Beyond the transparency was a darkness like the bottom of a mine. 
I don't know where I am, Colonel, he said finally. It's dark outside. I must have gone over the Terminator. He could sense the Colonel waiting like a trapped hawk. There was only a three-second time lag, but it seemed like more. It had made itself felt like a growing sense of distance all the way from the station. "'You didn't cross over,' insisted Markley's voice. "'We saw you land a hundred miles safe in sunlight. Can't you even see the stars?' "'The stars?' Jessop strained his face toward the little round hole of transparency, and yet he saw nothing. He felt strange, idiotic words rising. "'Someone's painted it black. I fell in a puddle of ink.' "'What's that?' shouted the Colonel. "'In God's name, man, talk sense!' "'I must have landed in a big shadow and fallen over,' said Jessop. "'That's why it's dark.' "'Apparently you hit on your head,' rasped Markley. "'Look, pull yourself together. You're not in any shadow. You skimmed right into daylight in the middle of Nubium.' "'You saw me land!' cried Jessop eagerly. "'How did it look from up there?' "'You went down from the west,' said the Colonel, speaking fast. "'Your jets started over the Altai range. "'You sailed over Regio, apparently pretty high, "'and slanted in towards the edge of Pitatus. "'Your jets blinked out just about fifty miles north of that. "'That's all we saw.' "'One of the steering vanes blew, and she was going to spin. "'I had to cut the jets too high,' said Jessop, "'his mind clearing rapidly.' "'Wait a minute, Colonel. I'll see what gives.' There was another interval of silence, underscored by the sound of his own laboured breathing. He explored his body with his hands, and found many sore spots, but no obvious fractures. He loosened the harness, and put his feet on the floor, bracing himself with his hands against the side of the tiny cabin. He stood there for a minute, swaying, before he realised what was wrong. The floor was down. That meant the ship was resting on her tail structure, and so the bull's-eye above his head should have gleamed with cold stars in fiery sunlight. He placed his hand against a tiny window and clicked on his wrist-light. The inner and outer surfaces of the transparency glared back in double reflection. On the outside was a sooty deposit, like a greyish something dipped in candle smoke. First things first, he muttered aloud, and started scanning the instruments. The chronometer showed that Markley had exaggerated. He'd been out only ten minutes. And he was losing air. Sickingly, he visualised the mess that must be down below, the jets and undercarriage smashed and twisted. Then Markley's voice interrupted his thoughts. "'Yes, yes, I see it!' The colonel was shouting at someone on the other end. Then his voice became low, hesitant. "'Jess, we may have something here. I'm looking at a photo of the spot you went down. I don't see a rocket, but there's a... a pit that looks different from the rest of the smallpox, like a dent in the hill of sand. I'm afraid to say what it might mean.' So that was it. Sand. No, volcanic ash. Of course they had known that parts of the moon would be covered with it. What they hadn't known, what even the space station's telescopes hadn't been able to tell them, was how soft the stuff was and how deep. Jessop felt an ancient horror clutching at him, a horror that should have been totally foreign to the vast sweep of space. He was buried alive. "'Like a stone in a puddle of mud,' said Markley gloomily to White, the station's second. "'Maybe we ought to be thankful. The stuff probably saved his life.' "'Saved him? What for if he can't get out?' The colonel shrugged his shoulders, his face an expressionless mask for his thoughts. White could sense the tortured anxiety of the older man more than anyone he had worked for and pushed Project Moon. He'd never really been a military man. Space was his driving mania. He'd risen to general once, but had been busted for plugging his conviction too hard. And now, in the penultimate moment, 
this. How deep could he be and still send? Markley asked of the man with the earphones. His signal's weak and distorted. Antenna might be damaged or partly under. At that, I don't know if a few feet of that dust would stop shortwave. Might be fifteen feet, muttered Markley, his face grey and tired looking. God, maybe he's still sinking. Sir, we don't know that he's that deep, cautioned White. I don't see how an impact would bury him like that. What do we know of the conditions? moaned the Colonel. The stuff must be absolutely dry and loosely packed. In the light gravity it probably flows like water. Quick sand! I should have thought of it. Jessop wants to know if there are any orders, sir, said the radio man. The question might have been phrased with a semi-humorous bitterness, but the Colonel answered seriously. Tell him to give us an estimate to the damage. Ask him if he thinks he can blast out. As a radio man spoke into the microphone, White was suddenly struck with the irony of the situation. Here was the historic moment they were talking to the first man on the moon. And what did it mean? Where was the thrilling revelation, the sense of triumph? A poor, blind man buried under a mountain of dust. Jessop says he can't tell much yet about the ship, says the radio man. He says to hold on. We'll be out of beam range in fifteen minutes, said Markley hollowly, his heavy shoulders hunched forward as if he were trying to reach his arms out to the sunken rocket. White felt the same helplessness. They could not even stop the station in its hurtling chase around the earth. Soon the moon would be lost from sight behind the vast, misty mass of the planet. He became aware of the New Mexico beep call, sounding furiously. He picked the phone up and listened to the angry, excited voice at the other end. Muttering an abject, unmeant apology, he handed the phone to Markley, who made an expression of distaste. "'Yes, General. We're going out of range soon.' Can you hear him down there? No, he didn't crack up. He's buried. We can't tell yet. Yes, buried in the ash. Volcanic ash or meteor dust, I don't know. I don't know. Yes, General. Yes, sir. He slammed the receiver down. Do they get him at all? asked White anxiously. Only a word here and there. They're going to try and clear the air a bit, widen his channel put a crimp in somebody's TV. If I hear one complaint, I'm dropping a bomb. "'We're going out of range now,' said Markley's voice in the earphones. "'They hear you down below. Keep sending. And good luck!' Other voices in the background echoed, "'Good luck, Jess!' He had a vision of the station's silver disc falling behind the bulging earth as the voices quivered into silence. He stood there for a while, steadying himself with both hands braced on a pressure wheel. Think, he said aloud, reading from an absurd little cardboard sign in his mind. And immediately he thought of the leak in the hull. What a stupid thing to forget! Already the air pressure gauge glowed a warning red. With a swift trained motion he poked the smoke button. White tendrils burst out and swirled eerily in the dim light. He watched anxiously as they converged near his feet and vanished, riding invisible currents of escaping air. There he found a bulge in the tough duralumin wall, evidence of a broken stanchion. Quickly he broke out a rubberoid seal pad and slammed it into place over the hole, pressing the edges firmly. Again he pushed the smoke button, and this time the streamers hung uncertainly about. He found there were no more leaks. He drew a deep lungful of the precious air and felt his muscles relaxing, and felt a sudden joyous hope. Since the welded seams of the cabin had held, perhaps even the power plant down below was intact. He had plenty of nuclear fuel. He needed only to get down there to repair the steering vanes, 
to refill their exhaust mass tanks with the moon's abundant material. Accidents had been provided for. There was a radiation-shielded pressure suit crammed into the tiny but adequate airlock. He had a vision of himself in it, battling the dust like a lunatic. But could he get out at all? If he opened the lock, would he be able to dig his way out, or would the dust flow in faster than he could push it back? It might jam the door mechanism, flow in around him. There was a rustling gabble in his earphones, many voices speaking at once. Now one voice came through more clearly as he clicked up the volume. "'Can you hear us, Jessup? New Mexico speaking. Can you hear us? Answer, please. Answer!' He felt an overwhelming surge of relief. "'Yes,' he cried. "'Yes, this is Jessup.' He repeated it over and over, deafened himself, shouting it, until an excited voice answered, "'Thank God! we finally cleared the air. We get you now. Are you all right? Can we help you? The world is with you!' Interference howled, rising and falling. Another voice intoned, "'Do not despair and turn away from God!' "'Think! Think!' He slammed his hand against the helmet, and the voices ceased. "'Think!' he said again. What he actually meant was act. He had to do something. The first thing, of course, was to get out of the ship. He could not go down into the radiation-infested hull from the inside. Repairs on the ship's structure, if needed, had to be done from the outside. He had the tools. Jessop examined the darkened porthole again, peering at the dust. Most of the particles were too fine to be seen separately, the residue of uncounted billions of shattered meteorites, fine as face powder. The stuff could be a foot thick above him, or ten. The fact that it was so fine meant that this was the lighter portion, the skim. The heavier particles must have settled lower in the sifting process of a million windless eons. Heaven knew how deep it was below him. In panic at the smothering darkness, he threw a switch, flooding the cabin with light. He felt a fierce desire to feel the moon dust in his hands, to grasp at any hope it might offer. There was a safe way. The tiny sample corer had been meant for the moon's rocks and minerals, but it whirred eagerly in his hands as he pushed it into the duranumen wall. The rush of air into the hole made a wet sucking sound. Slamming a seal pad into place, he examined the tool in his hand. The end of the core drill was filled with dust. Carefully, he shook the particles into his hand. He stared at them a long time foolishly. There weren't much to see, a few blackish, slippery-feeling grains like pulverised coal. Was this what he had come for? In the tense haste of landing he had barely seen the sunlit mountains, the panorama of glare and shadow above. Was this little handful of dust to be what he had lived, and most probably given, his life for? He flung it violently against the wall. The motion sent scathing pain into his bruised side. "'Cut out the self-pity!' he yelled aloud. Suppressing an impulse to cry out, he banged his helmet again and made the clear, welcome voice from New Mexico come floating back. "'What happened, Jessop? What's wrong? We don't hear you. Answer! Answer!' "'Why don't you try to get a little sleep, sir?' said White. We won't be in range for an hour yet. Markley was slumped before the comp panel, his hands in his pockets. His face was pasty white, the stubble sticking out on it like hoar-frost. Listen to this, he said, holding up a hand. The radio before him spoke with a smooth announcer's voice. Colonel Markley of the space station says that every effort is being made to assist Lieutenant Robert Jessop, the first man on the moon. Rescue is still out of the question, but Jessop appears to be in good spirits. 
He is acting on expert advice, but Colonel Markley says that suggestions from any source will be considered. If anything in your experience can help Bob Jessop, get in touch with your nearest radio or television station now. Hmm, expect anything? asked White. No. Then why? It keeps them interested, said Markley. Interested? Surely. Surely nothing, cried Markley, with a strange wild emphasis. Do you know why we weren't on the moon ten years ago? The techniques we're using now have been known a good deal longer than that. It was the cost. It was the public, snapped Markley bitterly, the fickle old public. There was a time when the idea of space shovel was a fad, when the rockets boomed in every Sunday supplement. We could have had plenty of backing then, but we weren't ready then by quite a few years. We had to build the space station first. But that was a military necessity, and a financial calamity. But the public had to swallow it, and maybe because they had to, because of our lithium bombs and the nervous tension of the war that never did come, the pendulum swung the other way. Now the moon ship's a different matter. But there was plenty of interest. To the average man, the moon's still made of green cheese, shouted Markley, waving a hand for emphasis. Oh, he can quote figures he's read. He can tell you how far it is, how big it is. But it doesn't really connect those figures with the moon out there. It doesn't feel what it is. White knew what the colonel meant. He himself had experienced a peculiar change of viewpoint on it coming to the space station. Call it a change in cosmic perspective. You can't blame them if they lose interest a little, he said lamely. It's been nothing but moon, moon in the news for years now. When Jessup landed, they had a right to expect something exciting. This thing is a terrible anticlimax. They expected the moon brought home to them, I suppose, sighed Markley. Pictures, descriptions, that sort of thing. All they've got now is a dud firecracker. A small boy on a New York street can see more of the moon than Bob Jessup. You talked to him last. How was he? Markley shook his head. "'Slowly, tiredly. "'His battery was running low. "'He hasn't tried to get out yet. "'Says he thinks the dust will jam the lock. "'And maybe he's right. "'Maybe he'd better wait for those suggestions.' "'For the hundredth time, "'White turned Jessop's problem over in his mind. "'He always thought of it as Jessop's problem.' never having been able to identify himself with the midget-sized fanatic who had boarded the moonship. Markley, he knew, had envied the pilot like a shipwrecked sailor envies the free-winging albatross. But not he. That did not mean he didn't want to help. He felt the same desperate longing to help that people have always felt for submarine crews who vainly tap their calls for help on the sides of their sunken vessels, for buried well-diggers or miners caught by cave-ins. But what could he, what could anyone, do? I wonder what he's doing now, said White softly. Jessop lay in soft darkness, quiescent. He was in the airlock. Rivulets of sweat ran down his prone body inside the pressure suit, and the incoming air was an icy sword in his back. For forty hours now the rocket's cabin had been growing warmer as the unseen sun above blazed on the dust. He had turned off the friendly chug-chug of the air conditioner to conserve power, and the heat was becoming unbearable. What was it he had to do? Was it better than roasting alive? Oh well. He kicked clumsily at the pedal which actuated the outer door of the airlock. The door plug scraped unpleasantly on his metal boots as it slid aside. Push. Kick. The legs moved stiffly, like pipe joints. He reached above his head with the suit's clumsy arms and pushed. Slowly the suit scraped outward. He could feel only a soft, yielding resistance on his feet. A wild hope rose within him. Perhaps the dust was loosely packed tenuous enough to tunnel through. 
Then he was running in a waking nightmare, running in molasses. A soft yielding something was flowing around his feet, deadly smothering stuff unseen in the pitch darkness. Panic seized him as first one leg and then the other became stuck fast. Desperately he waved his arms until the suit's mechanical hands caught on the handwheel of the inner door. His wet palms slipped on the manipulators as he tried to apply pressure to turn the wheel which refused to move. He put every ounce of his strength into his arms, and gradually the wheel began to turn. Slowly at first, and then in a rush the door plug moved aside. He clung to the hand wheel as an unseen force pushed down at him suddenly felt his legs come free as the cabin's outrushing air forced back the dust. When the pressure lessened, he managed to squeeze the bulky suit through the inner door and into the now airless cabin. He fought the door back into place. Safe. Relief was as overwhelming as his panic had been. He stood there for a full minute, feeling nothing but joy and thankfulness that the dust could not come in after him. Then the sting of sweat flowing down his forehead and into his eyes swiftly brought him back to reality. Safe indeed. For what? He had hoped against reason that he could tunnel through the dust to the surface. Perhaps he would soon have roasted to death in the sunlight, but he would at least have stood on the moon the real moon, not this coffin where he was already dead and buried. But wasn't he on the moon? Wasn't this what he had wanted all his life? Wasn't this what he had come for? What had he come for? It was a question he had never really asked himself in the proper light, with a proper urgency. Others had asked it, "'That crazy Jessop! I wouldn't be in his boots for a million bucks!' What does he want to go to the moon for? What good's the moon? The men who had said those things had been right, of course. He was crazy. And the question would never be answered, from their viewpoint. For them, the moon was just an ornament, a beautiful ornament in the summer sky. It was strange that he had never been in a position where he had to think out his reasons for coming on the moon ship. He'd been too busy fighting for the chance to wonder just why he wanted it. Markley was like him, of course. He wondered if the colonel would trade places with him right now. Maybe he would at that. Ever since he'd been a kid, Bob Jessop had wanted the moon. Not for himself so much, but for the others. It had been a deep hurt when he met others who didn't want it at all who didn't even seem to know it was there. To him, it was a symbol of the greater reality, a stepping stone to the stars. His body sagged under the weight of an overwhelming longing. Not to be back on earth, but to go forward, to show the way. And suddenly he saw the blinding simplicity of the answer. It's only a paper moon hanging over a cardboard sea. The moon's still in the news, said White softly, as the strains of the old song floated over the station's bridge. They're dancing to it, said Markley with an irrational bitterness, while he's still alive out there. Do you suppose we'll still be able to receive him? You said his batteries were just about gone. We'll soon know. The radio man stuck his head into the room. I focused on Nubium, sir, just out of the horizon. Markley started droning into the microphone. Jess up, Jess up, come in, come in. Yes, yes. To White, the time seemed endless until Markley turned and said, His air's gone. He tried to get out and couldn't. He's speaking through the communicator hookup of his suit, and I can barely hear him. Suddenly the colonel stiffened. 
"'Yes, yes, I hear you,' he shouted. "'You what? But that's crazy. No, I order you not to.' He tore the earphones from his head and dived for the tube leading to the radome. White exchanged puzzled glances with the other two men watching, and then followed. Markley was at the telescope, cranking handwheels, swinging the tube on its airtight joint. The large quartz port showed the moon, nearly full, just rising from the misty horizon. The instant White turned his eyes on it, he saw the flash. The searing blue-white fire was like a glimpse of the sun. Then, from the tip of Mara Imbrium, from the mouth of that ancient pockmarked face, rose a bright plume of smoke. "'My God!' cried White. "'He's blown himself up!' Quite perceptibly the plume widened, its jet-back shadow crossing the moon's face like a sword-cut. Gradually it thickened at the top, still rising like a shining fountain in the sunlight. It was beautiful, but with a beauty surpassed for White by its horror. "'Why did he do it?' he groaned, trying to understand. The spectacle possessed him, even as he struggled against it. This was the moonship, all their work going up in a cloud of atomic dust. This was the accident they had all feared. And it hadn't been an accident. Why? Markley looked at him with a face that was old, but with eyes that were strangely bright and proud. If you don't know why, when you look at that, he said slowly, you'll never know. Then, stung to anger by White's blank face, he shouted, Don't you see? He had to do something. Then suddenly White understood. Men like Markley and Jessop had fought against the indifference of men like himself for hundreds of years. Theirs was not a personal ambition. The buried moonship had been a deadly fizzle, a so what, a tainted success. This was a spectacle a billion people would see and feel, a miracle. The man-made tree grew where nothing had ever grown before, its branches thickening and spreading, hiding the moon's face like a tantalising veil. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. Go on, it's completely free. No cost at all.